we got, you know, I because I was about to say we got a legend in the building. But you're so damn young. I hate to call you a legend. But you feel like a legend because you've been doing this for so long. I am a legend. We got Chicago's. Oh, yeah, okay, they, so so you, you're not offended by me saying because no, that's actually a compliment. Okay, I'm a young. We legend. We got a legend in the building. We got you, there. You go. We got a young legend in the building. We got Chicago's own. She been doing it for so many years. Killing the game. The first lady of drill, a.k.a. Drillery Clinton. Please welcome to Vlad TV. My Katie. girl, Katie, got bands. <laughs> Katie, what up, girl? What it do? I'm honored to be back again. Welcome back to Vlad TV. Uh, it's it, it been a long time coming. We got a lot to catch up on. And, um, you know, <laughs> you got a lot going down this week. Um, and, yeah. and typically I don't start my interviews off getting right into it. I get the backstory, but I got to start with this whole Asian doll thing. What is going on with you and Asian doll? Nothing, just talent. I'm just showcasing my talent. Okay. If you don't mind, I, I because, and maybe I just got caught off guard with this. Where did the back and forth between y'all come from? Was this something that was brewing over time? Was it something that was said, something that was done? You just dropped a diss record or, or previewed a diss record. That didn't come from nowhere. There wasn't a diss record. I don't do diss records. What you call it? I delivered a statement on the record. Okay. So again, where did where, where did all that come from? If you don't mind me asking, disrespect. The disrespect. Elaborate on that. Mm, well, you know, I don't care about nobody saying they the queen and all that. We can, we all kings and queens. It's the disrespect. You know what got a response from me, but like I'm not doing the back and forth and all of that. I'm working. I'm busy. I don't even have time to be trolling. Okay, so judging by what you just said, I'm assuming the fact that she called herself the queen of drill, you took that as a disrespect. Uh, she threw shots at me. That was the disrespect when it was direct to me. She disrespected my city, our culture, my throne. That's why she got a response from me, but I'm not going back and forth with all that. If you say you the queen, own up to it. Like, but you will never be me. I, if I stop rapping today, you will never be me. Like, I'm having fun. Like, I'm not at home mad and doing all of that, trying to gang up with people to do nothing. I'm, I'm one of a kind. I'm unstoppable by myself. My talent and work speak for itself. I don't have to argue. My legacy speak for itself. Like. Mm hmm. You know, you put out a tweet and you said first you stole Cash Doll name from her. Now you coming for Drill Queen. Damn, bitch. Do you do do you originate anything? That's facts. <laughs> That's facts. I hear you. I mean, um, when I read that, I'm like, oh, OK. Katie don't hold her tongue. No. And, you know, another thing is, like, it don't matter. Like, what are they going to define any of these other female artists as? Like, when you speak on Katie, you're going to say, like, Katie known from doing this, this, and that. Like, I don't have to go out here to be pretending and doing none of that. Like, I don't have to go throwing shots at nobody. Like, my lane is my lane. Even if it was another female before, after, or during the process, like, you know, mm -hmm. I am, not was, I am the first lady of drill. I am Drillery Clinton. I don't have to do all of that. Like, it's verified in the streets and in the industry. So, like, what am I arguing for? No, you're right. When, when people think of Katie Got Bands, they think of drill music. You've been doing this for at least 10 years that I know of. It's my 10 year uh, anniversary. 
Yeah, like like you do that drill thing. And we're gonna get into it. But before I switch subjects here, Katie, I wanna I wanna compliment you. Like I said, you're a young OG. It ain't often, if ever, that an artist shows up <laughs> on time for an interview, let alone early. You was early for this interview, <laughs> ready to go, yeah. poised, like, yo, let's do this thing before time. Like, is this just, yo, Sean, I've been in this game forever. I, I, I respect people's time. Or was you always like this? I mean, I, I've been like this, but it was like in the past when I had interviews, shows, or anything, it was like management in the past was causing the artist to be late, but then when you show up, it's all fall on the artist, you know? But it's like the past and stuff that I went through in the past has helped build a better person and a better artist. I have to respect other people's time just as well as my own. Now, I think that that's a good quality to have. I could tell you somebody who worked, you know, as somebody who worked at a record label for many years, somebody vice president at a record label, I always made my staff go extra hard for those artists that no matter how big they were, no matter how new they were, whether they got their first hit or they were on their fifth hit, when they treated others the way that they wanted to be treated, when they respected people's times, when they respected people, you know, I get it. You all are artists and um, you have to move a certain way, but yeah. you're still human beings and all human beings want to be treated with respect. So whenever I found that an artist had that quality to still treat people with respect, no matter where they were financially or in their career, I always told the team, we gonna go hard, we gonna break this artist. So I thought that that was such an admirable thing, you being here bright and early. Yeah, thank you, I, I had to. You can't demand respect and you don't give it. You can't show up to an interview mm -hmm. three hours late, that was bad. They do it every day, but I'm telling you, it didn't go unnoticed. Trust me. That's what makes All me right, different, so let's right? Take a... What'd you say? I said, that's what makes me different, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> let's take it back to the beginning. You grew up on the south side of Chicago. Um, the Ida B. Holmes Projects. Ida B. What Wells. What was it like growing up? The Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells Holmes. There we go. Yeah. I mean... I grew up, Wales home projects. Yeah, we grew up like it really did take a village. Like in the in the community, like a lot of the older guys and the older females always did stuff. Like it took a village with us. Like we grew up with picnics and you know, like we had after school programs, after school matters. Like I learned how to swim. I learned how to dance in my like in my community centers growing up. Like you know, uh, there is nothing that I can't do. And if I don't know how to do it, I'm I'm gonna learn. Like it was like growing up, shit, we seen everything, like from knowing how to survive, like, you know, from from welfare to seeing people, you know, selling drugs, doing drugs. We was stealing cars, like I'm a project baby. Everything we rap about in the music, we trying to escape from what we see, like, you know, every day. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. like I appreciate oh. my childhood a lot though like the older I get and as I look back on things why is that specifically it like coming from the projects a lot of people like don't have survival skills they like I grew mm. up with love and unity even though you know we we fought each other growing up too but we know how to stick together though like you know You know, those projects are legendary. Um, yeah. I'm not from Chicago, and we heard about them Them yeah. projects. Ida B. Wells was legendary. Ida B. Wells. Who Absolutely. Else? Absolutely. 
I come um, from legendary land. That's what I be trying to tell them. Like, it ain't no cap in my rap. Like, my mother and father gotcha. is a legend. Like, in speaking about that, did you grow up in a two family um, household, or was was no. they split up? No, my daddy did twenty seven years. Well, Are you serious? Yeah, he just came home. My mother was my father. Okay, <laughs> so let's talk about this for a second, because that's always a, a, a very um, needed conversation. Your daddy did 27 years. For what do you mind me asking? Murder, robbery. Mm. He got a rap sheet. That was the main two okay. charges, though. Okay, so your daddy been in prison for the since I was two years old. I'm 29. Yeah. Since you, yeah, like yeah. you don't, you almost don't know this man on the street. Did you keep in contact with him? Yeah, the whole what bit. What was it like? Even the whole bit. Mm hmm. I still talk to him now. I had to go to, and I'm his only child too. I had to build a relationship uh -huh. with him, like, behind a wall. Was it difficult as a young woman coming into your own, not having a... Because that's mm -hmm. all too common in our community. Yeah. You know, a, a lot of people are growing up and their, you know, parent, one parent or the other is locked up. Yeah, but, yeah, basically, like, growing up, a lot of decisions that I made and, like, the way that I got treated, I used to always say, like, it, my life would be different if my daddy was here, like, or if I'd be crying and having a bad day, he'd call and make it right, like, even with the music, like, even though he out in the real world now, like, and trying to adapt and adjust to it because he's institutionalized, but, like, I'm growing and learning with him every day, but, like, growing up, people used to tell me, like, I, I was my, my mother is the main person, she used to tell me I was my daddy's son, I should have been his son. She said I was like a mm. little tomboy. <laughs> I, I know you are your daddy's only child, but on your mother's side, do you have siblings? Yeah, I'm her only do, only girl. I'm the middle child on my mother's side. So I'm, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm a little spoiled still as an adult, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a big brother and a little brother, but I'm the oldest, you know. <laughs> but you, so your 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 mom, you know, I've watched interviews where you said my mother was the one; she was always there for me. Um, you know, I didn't always listen to her, but she was the one always there for me. Did you feel you had a closer relationship with your mother because your father wasn't there, or you know, regardless to the fact whether he was there or not? Like my mother is just that person in my life. Mm. I kind of don't even have the best relationship with her either, but we working on it. Like, but it's better than what it was, cause like I'm not the young Katie. Like I'm a, I'm an adult now. Like, and I'm starting to understand and pay attention more. Like, you know, and it's like a lot of stuff that my mother told me, <laughs> and I didn't listen, and I had to learn the hard way, cause I always used to tell her growing up, let me learn the hard way. And guess what? Your mother always right. Your mother always going to be in your corner, whether you're right or wrong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, going back to the Ida B. Well projects, home projects, um, you know, wasn't that like the old stomping grounds for the Black P. Stones game? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The Ida B. Wells, yeah. We had a lot of different. Yeah, because I've read they, they, their founder, and this is probably even before your time, but, you know, legacy is legacy. Um, Eugene Hairston, he was shot and killed, shot dead in the projects. Did you grow up hearing that name? Yeah, I heard that name, but I don't, I don't know who it is, though. I heard some things about him, though. Yeah, he's a co-founder of that gang, you know, so so them projects r ring out. Another case that made national history coming out of, or national 
news coming out of them projects was Eric Moss. Does that name ring a bell for you? Yeah, that's. Uh, I read a book on him. He the, the kid that got threw out the window in the dare homes. There you go. Yeah. We actually yeah. just shared that picture of him over the summer on the internet. Again, I remember that case when I was young. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he was something like a five-year-old boy who was who was murdered in the early 90s. But it wasn't just that he was murdered. He was murdered by two kids that was pretty much his age. I think both of them was like 11, year, 11 years old. Mm -hmm. So it just really got into the mindset like, yo, what's really going on out there that, that kids are throwing kids off roofs? Yeah, we just, we just, we coming from where I come from. We seen a lot at a young age, like it coming from the Adam B. Wells. The police ain't deal with our, nothing that we hear going on. Like, and I know that from experience and from stories and stuff that I was told when I grew up. Like, the police never dealt with nothing, you know, in the projects. My people used to flip over garbages and deal with it on their own. Like, and I remember that as a kid, like. It ain't no structure out here no more. Ain't no respect or nothing. Like, you can't. It's different from when I was growing up, and I'm only 29. Like, we do respect our elders. Well, I do. I can't speak for everyone else. When you was a kid, I know you I know you said you didn't always listen to your mother, so I'm assume at least you respected her. You said you respect your elders. Um, but when you was young, did you get into a lot of trouble? Hell yeah. <laughs> I'm my mama problem child. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm her only girl. That's crazy, right? Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. was it wasn't even that I was bad. Well, yes, I was. Shit. I used to get whoopings, punishment, run away, get put out. Um, yeah. Well, I ain't necessarily get put out. My mama thought taking me to my aunties on my daddy's side was punishing me when they listened to me and still let me be a kid and party and do whatever. <laughs> 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 What's some of the worst things that you saw coming up in them projects or just being a kid? And I mean, because it, Chicago is known. I mean, it, it's Chirac. It's crazy. Like, it's serious out there. Did you actually see things going down? And if so, like, what were some of the worst things you ever saw? Yeah, we seen people get their brains knocked out in broad daylight, but everybody was taught to go on. Like, so we all been dealing with PTSD, like going to funerals and stuff. Excuse me, that became a common thing now. Like, and now I see why growing up, my mother never let me sit, go to funerals. Like, like it's, it's very, like, it's crazy. Like, you walk out the door, you, she might don't even make it back in the crib, like, it's different though from back then, but it's like kind of the same way, but it's way worse. Mm -hmm. Like it was, like it used to be hard to come up on a pistol back then. You had to really be somebody or know somebody or have some money or whatever. But it's like that's how the kids starting younger and younger with carjacking and robbing and killing and stealing. Cause of like, come on now, eleven years old, how you getting a gun? You know, that's so true. And the crazy thing about Chicago is it it's like all of the people who are dying, they're kids. They, they, they're legit kids, like 19 and down. Of course, you know, you got, you got people killing each other older, but it feels like every time you turn around, it is real kids in the truest sense of the word that are either taking a life or losing their life. Why is that? I just told you it ain't no structure out here no more. Like, and then it's like the parents, you can't tell them nothing about their kids. Like, how you scared of your 11 year old? Shit, I'm 29. I still want to play with my mom. She slapped mm -hmm. me to the floor. Like, what? It's, it's really the parents and the communities. Like, and it's like they took away all of the 
the the activities like when I grew up, we had after school matters. We had after school programs, or we could go over our kids in the friend house and play or do whatever, you know, as kids. And we knew it was either some who had to go in when the street lights came on, or it had to be in by seven, eight, nine o'clock. She, you would walk outside and see a five year old still outside. Like they took away, it's like they took away the sinners. Ain't nothing for them to do. So what they gonna do? Go rob, steal, and kill. Damn. Oh. You know, it's so sad because, again, we talking about kids in the most literal sense of the word. Robbing, stealing, and killing. And and that's just everyday life. But I like that you brought up, uh, you said you had PTSD. Still do. And didn't even realize it. Like, like when did it even come to your attention? Like, yo, I'm suffering from something that has been traumatic in my life, even if I didn't realize it at the time. Mm. It started bothering me mentally, physically, emotionally, like it started distracting me. And once I started paying attention and monitoring like things that I was dealing with, like I was crying out for help. I tried venting to people when I just went and got a therapist, like, and I only been seeing a the therapist for like, not even a year now. I haven't been to see her in these last past months because I've been so busy. So I've been like finding different techniques to help me deal with like my anxiety been through the roof lately, but like I've been uh, taking this natural herb tea and these uh, pills to uh, monitor, but I haven't taken it that in a few days either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, coming from these environments, we all, you know, suffer with trauma that we don't even realize we have. Mm -hmm. You know, even your projects that we're talking about in 2002, was you still living there when they tore them projects down? Just seeing a place that, yo, I grew up in and them buildings ain't even standing no more. Was you, was you still living in, in that area? Yeah, I was actually still living in the buildings as well because the buildings got tore down in 2007. Oh, okay. But the project got locked there. down in two thousands as well. But I was living in the buildings as well. Like I, I was in every part of the IDB Wells, from the gotcha. low rises to the high rises, apartments, all of it. Like, so psychologically, did did that affect you? Because demolishing them buildings is is really demolishing a part of your childhood, and would you say that it made the crime better or the crime worse? Worse. Taking people out of their homes and now they have to relocate. It made it worse. I can say both. It did both. Like, I say worse because, like, when, like, growing up, like, a lot of people... And a lot of Chicago artists I grew up with as well. And it's like, we got a lot of talent here in the city, but like people losing their life over it or whatever. But it's not even just that too, it's the violence as well. But like when they took the projects down, it's like other people moved on other to other neighborhoods or other blocks and started claiming other stuff. But it was like, where I come from, like we grew up off unity. Like we stick together. But it's like when some people move, they start going over here and became this and that. You eventually, you moved to Atlanta. Did you move to Atlanta because those buildings got tore down? Or did your mother ship you to Atlanta for another reason? I shipped myself. I'd have been back and forth from Atlanta to Chicago for the last past years. It don't matter how many times I went to Atlanta, I always was home mm -hmm. in Chicago. Where'd you go to school? Did you go to school in, in Atlanta or did you go to school? And I'm talking high school. Did you go to high school? High school, I went school to school in Atlanta? Chicago. I, every, I finished school in Chicago. I went to Young Women's Leadership uh, Charter School and I graduated from Youth Connection Leadership Academy. Got you. Is it, and I should have asked you this earlier, where, where did your love for rap come from? Because you you really come across through your music as a hip hop purist. Rapping just seemed to be in your blood. Did it you is. discover that in the streets or did you discover that in school? Uh, 
in the streets and from the house, from home. Like, I found out that my mother used to rap back then, but she didn't really take it serious. But, like, a lot of my family members, like my cousin, the DJ, my other cousin, the producer, like, both of them inspired me to do music. So, like, it's in mm -hmm. me. Like, I always used to be in the studio growing up with them. And I used to be like, I want to rap. They never took me serious because I was bad. And I played too much, like. I kept getting in trouble driving my mama crazy as a juvenile before I graduated from high school. Kept going to jail, fighting and doing all that. And Block called me one day. And the rest was history. Okay, we talking Block on the track. Yeah. It, it, is that your family? It's my cousin. Uh. He one of the ones who inspired me. Shout the Block. So, what made him finally say, yo, you know what? I know this my cousin. I know she played too much. <laughs> I know she in and out of jail. I know she bad and hard-headed. But I'm going to give her a chance with this music. Uh, he told me I had to come up with a name. He was like, it's not as easy as it look. He was like, you need a name. You need this. You got to stop going to jail. Like, And it was like... Me, like my friends and my uh, cousins and god sisters when we was growing up, like we was Nikki fans, you know, still is. Like they, like the older girls was the Barbies and we was the Dows. Like, and Katie got bands came from me being a Dow and the got bands came from me hand licks, you know, when I, when I was hustling and getting money, like, and it was like that name came and then Block was like, let's go. I kept getting in trouble. He fell back a little bit. But then when I started listening, I still wasn't listening. Because I was fresh out of high school. I was still mm -hmm. a kid. I couldn't wait to say I'm grown. When I turn 18, I don't got to listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you turned up. And I think this is somewhere around 2011. Maybe you just graduated high school. Yeah, I graduated I June 17, 2011. Okay, the song, I Need a Hitter. <laughs> <laughs> Where that record come from? Like, like, walk me through that process. It's the truth. I need a hitter, dreadhead driller, cashed out nigga, because I'm a lady hitter. Like, come on now. I was young and turned. Everybody loved the dreads, and I loved the dreads at the time. I don't know more, but yeah, I, you know. And it's like, it's, it was Chicago. It was the truth. It was Katie. Like, that song came from my everyday lifestyle. And I was so really... you just rapping about your life? Yeah, pretty much. And I was, <laughs> I was in love with a dread at the time. I hear my lady hitters. I hear females want to tow pipes and everything. It's crazy. Um, obviously, you done seen this a million times, but... You was in the video for um, Shady's, the, the, the Shady joint, Go In. That was and the highlight of the, gun. of the moment, yeah. Yeah, you holding a gun, <laughs> and that joint turned into a meme for years. That was so funny. <laughs> that wasn't even supposed to have been in the video. And I caught a gun case two weeks later. They tried to use that against me. Get out of it. That was a prop. Shout out to Franks. <laughs> was it a prop? Yeah. You, you, it was a real prop? It was a prop. Oh, I thought you was just joking. I'm like, yo, you done beat that case. That case is long gone. Mm, it was a prop. So real talk, how did it feel seeing yourself as a meme for so many years? Every time I see it, it's like the moment happening again, but it's bigger and bigger and bigger. It be funny, like, but it's a it's a legendary dance. It mm -hmm. feel good. You know, it's crazy because it almost feels like, and I don't want to speak out of turn, but it almost feels like you paved the way for Indeed. females holding pistols. I did. Especially for my generation. Mm -hmm. For my generation and the generation up under me. I did. Yeah, it feel that way. Because I'm trying, even it's as you're truth. talking, I'm trying to think of 
different artists that, you know, different female artists that was going at it as hard as you and, and, and talking that street talk, and especially during your generation, you might be right. No, nah, I am right. And who did it for 10 years? And I can yeah. make other type of music? And I can still give them drillery? Who doing it? Who done it? <laughs> me. You, let me ask you something. Are you surprised that drill music has blown the way it's blown? Because, you know, drill music, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm from the East Coast. So when we was hearing people like King Louie back in the days, that was kind of our introduction to drill and that sound. But now, you know, you got some of the biggest drill rappers in the game from Brooklyn, New York, from the Bronx, New York. You got drill rappers overseas. Uh, are you shocked at where, where that sound has gone? No, I'm not. Mm. No, because Chicago, not even just myself, but other Chicago artists as well, we have influence. Chicago as a whole, with music, with instrumental with dancing with our food chicago culture period like it doesn't surprise me but it's like it's crazy how it's like if chicago will stick together and support one another we we really it here in the city like everybody what is drill new york what is drill uh uh uh, uh london like no disrespect to the other states and in countries and none of that, but I'm saying drill is originated here in Chicago. Like, no, I'm not surprised, but I am because, like, I'm happy that I'm a part of the wave and I'm putting in work for real to show our culture in the city, like, everywhere. Like, this is what's old and deserved to us. Like, look at from back then, from like, Crucial Conflict, Bump J, like all of their music is hip hop, but it was still drill. Mm -hmm. In the Chicago area, who would you say really created that sound? Like I said, when we first started hearing, I remember King Louis, but I'm not sure if he just popularized it or if he was really one of the creators. He is one of the creators, drill music come from like in the era from 2011, 2010, it, it, he was one of the artists, King Louis and Pac-Man was to rest in peace to Pac-Man cause I grew up listening to his music as well before I even touched the microphone. But like Chief Keef, Dirk, Fredo Santana, may he rest in peace. Like FBG Duck, may he rest in peace. King Von, like I grew up in the era, like, like E-Day, may he rest in peace. Like. Uh, Sasha Go Hard, Pretty in Pink, like, they all paved the way with Chicago. Yeah, but you know, it, it felt like when Chief Keith dropped that I Don't Like, <laughs> it went yes, from that, being that. Uh, a, a sound to a phenomenon. Yeah. All of a sudden, Sosa the goat. It, it was... <laughs> Sosa the Goat. Chief Keith that, definitely. That I don't like was different. Yeah. He did that one for the culture. That don't like that love Sosa. That nigga, I'm 300. Like, Chief Keith got them anthems. And that was 2011, 2012, 2013. Like, mm -hmm. he got a catalog for sure. That same year he dropped that, you dropped the Bands and Hitters mixtape. Yeah. And Sean yep. Mack and DJ Ferris hosted it. Shout out to Sean Mack. Shout out to Ferris. And DJ Cook. Ferris. Damn, yeah. you just brought up the... Those is my boys out there. Shout, shout out to both of them. I've been heavy hitters rolling with me from day one. That's, ain't no cap in my rap. Like, Oh, my God. you. It took me a second. Um, You was like DJ Ferris. I'm like, hold up. That's my brother for years. Yeah, because you brought up Bears and Hitters, so you know what you know. That was my very first tape. Bears and Hitters, because I was about to drop Drillery Clinton one, but I put that on hold, and I dropped Bands and Hitters. But if you pay attention to my music from Bands and Hitters to Drillery Clinton one, you can hear in the lyrics and my delivery, everything, like the growth, even now on DC4. Like from Bands and Hitters, what? 
I was in the studio drunk partying. Mm-hmm. I was slurring on songs. Daily <laughs> was rapping bars. But now I take my time. I don't like all them distractions in the studio with me. None of that. See, damn, that's something, um, you know, that's that OG talk. And you, and again, you a young OG. All these <laughs> artists think that they need to go to the studio and have 50 people in the, in the room with them. Everybody got to be licked up, smoked out. And, and like you said, all it is is a distraction and you end up paying more because you in there wasting studio time. Hmm. And you're not focused on what you want to do. Like, if you're not coming with me to the studio to, like, to bring out Nothing like no bars. You ain't telling me like, no, switch your flow to this. Like, what are you there for? You're not serving the purpose. Like, I could party with you. I'll do that on the regular. Like, and I'm, I would rather party making the song versus going, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Talk to me about this Drillery Clinton mixtape. Where'd that name come from? The fans. And it came from, because I, I was, like, around the time when Drillery Clinton, the name came, uh, Hillary Clinton was running, and I was a fan of her. She was the first lady, and since they, you know, I'm the first lady of Drill, it was, like, on some presidential. That's where my go vote, little bitch slogan come in at with my marketing, you know, like. But uh, this guy named Cal, he interviewed me for the Red Eye newspaper, like, around the time when I was about, I was battling with bands and hitters and Drillery Clinton. But I, I I was running with the name Drillery Clinton, but I made them wait and drop Drillery Clinton, the mixtape after I dropped bands and hitters because I was already promoting it. But the fans in the city gave me that name, like, and they've been riding with it, like, from day one. Damn, so that, so that name really came from the streets? That came from the fans? Yeah. Oh, damn. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. I got the newspaper to prove it. My mother still got it, too. Every newspaper, every magazine I was in. This was when Ox Corps just started popping. We were still listening to mixtapes. Like, I caught 106 in part before they cut it off. Mm-hmm. Pop Out was on 106 in parties. I was on MTV. Uh, I was the only female in the city that got picked overall with the first uh, promo in the city. Like, but I had ended up having them add other females on there. But like, mm-hmm. I've been here influenced like with the music. Always been one of the only females on any bookings. Okay. Um, before I even go further, shout to mommy. Shout to your mother. It ain't nothing like a mother. <laughs> you yeah. said she had all the clippings, all the articles. She still got everything. And that's yeah. what a mother do, no matter how much trouble you get into. And you have been very open about, like, I was bad. Was. Your mother right there, proud of her baby. <laughs> I was bad. <laughs> I, I put my mom Okay. So on that Drillery Clinton mixtape, you, you just mentioned it. But Pop Out, this was the record, you know, I, I, I think it's when I first really, really started to learn about you. But that that had to be your biggest record, correct? It was one of my biggest records. And, and that record had King Louie on it. Mm. I had Make Me Rich as well with Jeremiah and Shahuva. I got Little Bitch. I got Why You Mad. I got Lick Off the Mid, a uh, reggae anthem. I have Stand On It Now. I got big records. Like, like DC records. for the project that really got everybody attention right now. Mm. And and how did you how did y'all even come together to do that record? Which record? The 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 pop out record. Oh, um, I was about to start on my second verse, and like me and him like used to have we used to have the same, we was a part of the same camp or whatever, like, and it was either my studio town was first or his and vice versa. So we used to always come and see each other's sessions, like whether I was first or he was first. But this particular day, um, I was about to work on my second verse for Pop Out. 
And he came in there, and Block was like, see if Louie will jump on this or whatever. And we told him to check it out in the studio. And we played it, and he liked it. He went in the booth, and he freestyled out four bars, four bars, four bars. Put a whole 12 on that. Like, that's how that happened. But, like, the hook in my verse and stuff was already done. But he was feeling it. Like, he knew it was a hit. That's dope. So, y'all, you know, because we live in a in an era where a lot of time people do features, but they not even in the same city. They not in the same state. They damn they ain't in the same country no more. They they just do their verse. They fly it in. So, y'all two was actually in the same studio together making that record. The record was done, but yeah, we was in the studio when he, yeah, pretty much you might as well say, cause he recorded his verse when I was about to start on the second one. So yeah, that was a different experience versus us sending each other songs back and forth. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was different, yeah. And I knew it was know. a hit before it dropped. Like, we ain't like drop no audio or nothing. I just dropped the video. And that was another thing I thought was dope because, you know, a lot of time artists give each other features, but they don't co-sign it. They don't show up for the video. It's just like, yo, you know what? I gave you the verse. I did my part. Leave me alone. Yeah, they don't he showed it. up for the video. <laughs> <laughs> you say what? He showed up for the video. Y'all in the video looking like old friends. The song was hard. Yes, it was. And it was like the chemistry on the record was everything, too. But I'm past the pop out, though. Like, Okay, but I want to stay back in that era for a second, right? Didn't you catch a, a gun charge around that same time? I don't know. I beat my gun charge. I don't know. Oh, I was fighting the case around that time because I said the law man, I won't snitch. I'm not no sellout. I was fighting the case when I made pop out. You was fighting it when you made pop out. But when got it, you? Oh yeah, when I yeah I was fighting. Did you have to do any time behind that? Uh uh, I don't even want to think about it. I hear that. I did. Uh, I violated and wasn't going in the pretrial services. I did 32 days with no bond in Cook County. But no, I didn't do no time other than that. I violated and hit the bond out again. But I beat it. Got you. When you was doing them 32 days, didn't your video drop while you was, or right before you went in? <laughs> it uh, they dropped it when I was locked up. I shot it and then I, yeah, I was asking them to hold it till I got out, but they dropped it while I was in jail. Damn. But they came and seen me and told me like, your video out. So by the time you hit the streets again, you popping everybody. She playing before that I hit the streets because it was girls coming on deck. Like I just seen your video. What you doing here? Are you serious? <laughs> I ain't going back. Okay, it felt like for for a time, every year you was dropping mixtapes because you you had Drilly Be Killing in one, in twenty thirteen, twenty fourteen you had, um, Drilly Quentin two. Twenty fourteen again, I, I want to say you had Coolin' in Chirac like that that year you dropped like two mix. You was I had zero busy. I had zero to thirty nine right behind cooling this shot. Right behind that, yeah. Uh, I came with DC three, Drillery Clint three. Um I came with the rebirth. And I came with DC four. I got probably ten or more tapes out if I or close to it. I got Bands of Hitters, DC one, DC two, DC three, zero to thirty ninth, cooling this shit rack. DC four, uh, that's seven. Yeah, I mean, I I know up until about 2017, you was dropping at least one or two joints every year. You know what you know. <laughs> you were serious about this 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 rapping thing, staying focused. 2017 roll around, you got arrested again. What was that over? 
I don't want to talk about that. Just being around the wrong people at the wrong place at the wrong time. Got you. I caught a uh, case for not running my mouth. Mm. I don't want to talk okay. about it. Fair enough. Uh, 2019 roll around and you dropped the Rebirth mixtape. But it was, it, this was the first time that there was a gap in between. You were going so hard, and then all of a sudden, about three years passed before you released another mixtape. What was going on in that time? Shit. Bad management, bad paperwork, bad decisions, being around the wrong people. Shit, steady losing people, trying to figure out life. Shit. Okay. I was mentally gone. And then it was what like people, exactly? people was counting me out like I was mentally not myself. Look at all the stuff we talking about, what I was going through. That's a lot to deal with as a human being, let alone an artist. Like, for one, I can't fail myself, let alone thousands and millions of people on top of my city, my family, my friends, my team. Like, that's a lot to deal with. Then being in the public eye, and I don't like people in my business unless I put them in it. Like, it'd it be a lot. They feel like you can't make a mistake. You can't mess up. So it's like, you know, you dealing with all of this different stuff going through your head. Like, that is a lot to deal with. Will you be mentally okay dealing with that? You know, I don't I don't envy artists, <laughs> real talk. I don't envy y'all. What y'all got to deal with, it's a lot. you know, it's a lot. And you got to do it in the public eye. I, I could deal with whatever I'm dealing with. And I got the, the luxury of going through it without being under a magnifying glass. Y'all don't. Mm-mm. You don't have no privacy. You really ain't even thinking for yourself. It's just, it's a lot, but I ain't complaining. I mean, you know, my gift is my voice and my talent, so I got to utilize it. I ain't tripping or none of that. But we just speaking on what was going on with me then versus now, but I'm happy that I did experience stuff that I went through because it helped build not only a better artist, but a better woman, a better individual. Mm-hmm. I know you didn't put music out during that time. Was you even recording? I did. I was putting music out. It just wasn't getting... People was overlooking it, trying to count me out. They couldn't count. I never not record music. I just, like, it was either I was dropping it or wasn't promoting it or was getting irritated, like, because I don't even care for social media like that. I so show my day. most, I show the real live, real things, what be going on in my life every day, like, but I don't, I don't even like cameras in my face, I don't like attention, you know? Mm-hmm. Damn. Um, again, I don't envy that lifestyle, like, like, y'all got a lot to go through. Yeah. You know, and you got to do it in the public eye. You you mentioned earlier about seeing a therapist. Was it during this period that you said, yo, you know what? I, I, I got so much going on. I really need to go sit down with somebody. No, it was actually um, I was seeing my therapist like coming into 2022. I like started seeing my therapist probably. But in between, yeah, like the, towards the end of the year, like fourth quarter, like around this time. But mm -hmm. I really haven't been to see her only probably once or twice this year, if that. But I still you, keep you, in contact with her. You speak about this openly, and that's one of the things, especially in our community, I don't think we do enough. Because it, it, it's always looked at as maybe weakness or maybe we just didn't have the resources to see a therapist and we had to figure everything out on our own. Why is it important for you to to be so upfront and open about the fact that, you know what, I did talk to, to a therapist? Because I'm not ashamed of nothing I go through in life. Nobody is perfect. We all need a therapist. Like this therapy to me, 
Like right here, sitting here talking to you in front of the camera. Like everybody needs someone who could talk, who they could talk to, who's not gonna judge them. Or sometimes you just need someone to listen. Mm -hmm. We all need it, and I'm not ashamed because guess what? Somebody who hear this interview or this conversation, I might inspire or motivate right. you know to go That's see right. a therapist, or they might reach out to me. No, you absolutely right. It, you know, I was talking to you off camera and um it just feels like and I don't know where you're at in your life, but I can tell you as a fan of the culture, a fan of hip hop in general, it feel like it's this rebirth, this resurgence. All of a sudden Katie got bands is is you back in the spotlight. Like does it feel that way to you? Yeah. It's like it's me, but it's a, a newer version of me, like you just said. Like, I just, I don't know. I can't even explain, like, how I be feeling sometimes. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll just be going off in the days and be like, dang, this really happening. Or I pray, or like, I'm very grateful. Like, I'm overwhelmed with joy, like, you know. And every day I'm like learning how to move like throughout certain situations with me becoming bigger and bigger every day because I don't treat myself as such. From sitting in your seat, can you feel the energy and the love that if that the industry, because all of a sudden, like, like I said, it, it feel like Katie is everywhere. Uh, we go, we're about to talk about your Nikki feature, Nikki, shout to Nikki Minaj. But again, you feel like, like, yo, I'm back front and center. Is, is your phone ringing more? Like, are, are you getting the same energy I'm getting? <laughs> the phone ringing more, but I'm answering less, like I, like I once stated. <laughs> like, when I'm doing the interview, they know it and they keep calling. They don't be respecting it or none of that. And it's like, I got to respect myself. And, you know, I got to be less accessible to my people, even family. Mm -hmm. Because I look like, I come up from a family in a neighborhood where we always around each other and it's gonna turn into a party or kick it. Like if I'm at my auntie house, if we at the park in the neighborhood, anywhere we go, it's gonna turn into a party. Cause all it mm -hmm. is is one person call one person or they pull up and see you right there. Like that's just how we do though, but like, in order for me to get to the next level where I'm trying to get to, or where I'm going to get to, like, I gotta discipline myself in those areas because that, that was my biggest weakness, being out in the open and in around my peoples. Even at the clubs, the bars, the, shit, it didn't been more funerals than graduations. Like, <laughs> man, Damn. it's crazy. Damn. Do you feel like this go round, you know, despite what anybody think, because, you, you know, you just talked about being disciplined. And sometimes being disciplined, like you said, you got to cut off people who you used to hang with. You got to cut off family members. I'm laser focused on a goal. And I, and I know how close I got. And I know where I'm trying to go. And the only way I'm going to get there is through hard work, through grind, and through a discipline that y'all might not understand. Yeah. Mentally, are you ready for that, this go around? I mean, yeah. I wasn't then because, like I said, I was a kid. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm a grown woman, and I'm maturing and growing and learning every day, and I'm accepting and taking accountability for my own actions, like, in decisions that I make. Like, I just had to have a conversation with a girl who I've been friends with for over 20 years, and I had to tell her, like, it's okay. Like, if we ain't on the same level, like, it's not no beef or nothing. Like, we outgrow people, places, and things. Like, we're not into it because we ain't hanging together every day you are not on the phone or you don't know my business no more, like, that's okay. I told her, like, for me to her, like, sometimes you outgrow friends, family too. Yep. 
But like, no. Nah. It's so real. It's like me having the heart that I got that kind of was my biggest problem, like why I was never elevating because when you elevate, you're going to shed. And it was like, I'm steady holding on the baggage. How I'm going to climb up? Like, and that's why I keep telling myself every day, like, no, 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 no. Because it be hard and it be hurting. Who don't want to answer the phone for their friends and family? Who don't want to go around their friends and family? But it's like, I got, I've been disciplining myself. Like, I've been spending a lot of time by myself, kicking in and having my own drinks, whatever. Good for you. Good for you. Speaking of answering the phone, tell me how this um, Nicki Minaj <laughs> Freaky Girl remix came into being. Hard work. <laughs> But uh, now she sent me the beat. I was kind of shocked before um, I even opened the DM, but I wasn't shocked because we already been bonding and building our own relationship for the past months. But like when she sent me the beat, I'm like, damn, she giving me the opportunity to get on her song, and she only want eight bars. <laughs> My anxiety started kicking in, but it was like in a good way. And I jumped in the shower while I prayed. And I just was like, damn, it's really happening. Because I already knew what I was going to do. I already knew she was going to pick me to go on the song. A word? Because I know how I rap. I knew what I was going to give. This was a Nicki song. And I sent my feature, my, I mean, I sent my verse right back to her. Like, that's why when she said on the video when she was live, she said all our turnaround time was quick and I think I probably was probably the first or second person who got my verse back to her. Yeah, because I mean he, he, who else was on that record? JT from the City Girls, Bia, Akbar, Akbar v. and Malibu, um, Malibu Mitch from New Malibu York. Mitch was on it too. Yeah, yeah, shout out to all the ladies in Nikki. The record is hot. So, so when Nikki hit you up, are you sitting there like because I mean, you got 10 years, and I, and I really want to talk about this part because it's somebody who's rapping. Um, it's somebody who is trying to build a business. It's somebody who's been working so hard trying to get to the next level. And it feel like they're watching their peers come in after them and blow up before them. So... For you, when you got that DM from Nikki and Nikki sent you that that beat and you know it's real, do you did you feel like yo, finally all these years of working, all these years of blood, sweat, and tears, it's all about to pay off. It's paying off right now in front of my eyes. Yeah, I still haven't even been able to take it all in, but like. I mean, like, I never been a hater either. Like, so it didn't matter if an artist started rapping after me and they blew up or whatever. Like, I always cheer my peers on. Like, you know, I'm not a hater. But it's like, it's a different feeling when you really work for it. Like, all the sacrifices, the blood, sweat, and tears, as you stated, everything. Like, like this ain't happened overnight. And I ain't tripping, though. Like, because we all got our own journey in our life already written out anyway. Like, so... It's like I was willing to make to take the risk, like to do what I gotta do. I ain't done. This the beginning. They ain't seen nothing yet. Mm, talk that talk, Katie. And and honestly, I wasn't even asking from the standpoint of hating. I, I'm asking from the or I was asking from the standpoint, you know, we all many people rather, they say they want something. And God will give you exactly what you want, but you go, he going to make you work for it. And, and, yeah. and the difference that I've seen between the most successful people on earth and the people who just say I want it is the people who stay in it. They never give up. They never quit. Eventually, they're rewarded. God, God gives them exactly what it is that they asked for. Yeah. But the people who quit because it didn't happen, I've been doing this for 10 years, I've been going hard, they don't realize just how close they may have been to their dream before they tapped out and gave up and said, you know what, this will never happen for me. 
That's because they be too busy trying to compare themselves to other people. Mm. You like your journey is your journey, your your lane, your road is your road. Like, and that's what makes me different from other people. Like, no matter what, like whether it's music, me helping out in the community with the kids or giving back, like, oh yeah. Like anything, like your lane is your lane. You can't compare. Cause like, I worked for 10 years and say if you was to start rapping today, you might blow. Well, you might gotta work too. Cause guess what, 10 years ago, I wasn't ready for all of this what's going on right now. When I say I wasn't ready, I mean mentally. I wasn't ready, I was a kid. See, look at how fast it happened. When I first, like, my very first song took right off. Like, I wasn't ready. I was young and reckless when I dropped my first song. Like, couldn't nobody tell me nothing. I'm not the KD I was, so it's like, it it happened the way it needed to. Mm-hmm. And that's a great perspective to have. It really is. Um, I saw an interview with you, and I think it was from this year. Uh... It said you was, or you said you was addicted to Percocet. Can we talk about that? Oh, that was with DJ Smiles. Oh, yeah, I did that interview in Atlanta. We Correct. Could, yeah. I mean, it's out. It's an interview. <laughs> I, I guess I'm, I want to have this conversation because there's somebody right now who's struggling. They're struggling. And when they see somebody like you who is brave enough to come out and say, I struggled as well, that could be all the difference in the world. So how did you, number one, even get to the point that that it would be considered an addiction? And number two, how did you manage to beat it? It's a bad thing, really. It's really the discipline because your man will believe whatever you tell it. So it's like, if I was saying, oh, I need to get off this, or because it was helping with my anxiety, really. That, that's the main thing why I started doing it. But it was like, once I started seeing, like, Everybody from my generation on under even people who older than me was getting like caught on to it. And I'm like, shit, we look like young crackheads, like pills and lean. Like that's like, come on now. That's why the fentanyl out here. Like, and I'm like, no, nah, I'm not finna crash out and popping pills. Hell no. Nah. Like, and I was like, I got to figure out a way to deal with my anxiety or my temper problem or whatever. And like, I was just trying different methods. Like I even cried out for help and people turned they back on me or I thought I was playing. So it was like a lot of people who seen the interview or heard about the interview was like, damn, I wouldn't have never knew. No, you wouldn't. Cause I ain't tell nobody I was popping first. You never would even be able to tell being around me unless I told you. Cause you know how people be doing stuff to fit in with the trends. Like, oh, I'm off two thirties. Like you look slow as hell right here. Nah. <laughs> like seriously, I, my generation is crackheads. Damn. I don't want to be a part of it. So hell nah, I ain't scared to get out here and see it. Nah, cause you could save another life and another life. That's right. That's right. That's a hundred percent right. You know, people, and you don't even realize what, what you just said is somebody who's going to watch this. That's going to benefit from it. it I really, get DMs really all the time. You do? Like it was, it was a lady reached out to me and wanted me to speak with her son. He was on him so big that he started stealing from his mama. Like, just to get high. Like, that's crackhead shit. Where I come from, I wouldn't dare steal from my mama. But that's what a, like, that's what a person with an addiction would do. They would do anything to get that feeling. Mm -hmm. Like, no, hell no. I wish somebody would talk to these people because it's like it's more younger people dying, like, there's so many people who younger than me that died out fake Percocets, females, males, even the ecstasy pills. Like when you was really going through this addiction, was you personally seeing people you know die? Because you mentioned fentanyl earlier, and we know that that is killing people left and right. It ain't even like you gotta be going crazy you know back in the days when when you thought of a person ODing 
they really overdosed. They they took too much of a drug. That fentanyl. Yeah, we just seen it. We, I didn't yeah. witness it growing up, so I know. Like that's why I said what I said. But back to your question. See, I'm getting thrown out. What would you ask me? No, I was just saying. Like, you, like, you was dealing with the addiction. Did you witness anybody pass away? Anybody die because of it? Mm. I was. I kind of like stopped around the time when a few people I know passed away. And it scared mm -hmm. me too. Like, damn, that could have been me, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a scary thing, and I'm glad you're talking about it. Um, you know, I love the fact that Nikki went out there and she put so many of her fellow female artists, um, you know, on a track with her. She showed love. No female. And, and you don't see that too often. No. Why, why do you think that so many female rappers, when they hit it big, they just can't seem to get along? The fans and the bloggers. What you mean by that? They stir up bullshit. Can't no fan make me think like, oh, I don't fuck with her or she's talking about me. No, I don't care. Like, for one, if you about your money and you about the bag, can't nobody get in the way of that but you. Like, can't nobody tell me who I could talk to. Can't nobody tell me who I could do a song with. From a female to a male, I don't care. Like, I'm going to work this business, right? Mm -hmm. And I got a man of my own. I'm not a follower. i always been a leader. I'm a natural born leader, so... I don't know. I don't like it that the female is not sticking together like the male do it. It's already hard being a female in a male dominant field anyway. So like why we can't stick together, why we got to tear each other down or why we can't just go at it with the talent and still shake hands. Nah, that's real. I mean, it's unfortunate because I think about people like Lil' Kim and Foxy Brown, you know, They've been beefing for 20 years, like literally 20 years. It ended up in a shootout um, in front of the legendary All right, we don't want to, we don't, I don't want to talk about that. Talk about what? No shootout. I hear that. But but again, we're not even going to focus on that. I'm just saying where it escalated to. Yeah, um, but like growing up, this I, week. growing up, I know that a lot of females was taught to come at their competition just like the males were too, but it's like if, if the males could jump on the song while we can't, like, I actually salute Nikki. She she did it for the culture. Who had five females that's not a group? Who had five females including themselves on one song? And it went number one, not only in the U.S., but in other countries as well. Like, who did that? She did it that's for the real. culture, like, I no, that's why I applaud her. That's why I applaud her because it just feels, you know, and I could be, I could be overthinking this, but it feels like when female rappers blow, they just can't seem to get along. Even this week in particular, you probably heard about this. I think it just came out today. Um, Cardi B and JT from the City Girls, they going back and forth. I don't know nothing about that. I was busy. Yeah, well, I'm sure when you walk up out of here, you're going to see it. But it's always... I'm trending on the internet would... right now, so I don't know. I don't see nothing but me. <laughs> like, talk I love both talk, of them Katie. shit. Like, shit. I was just on WGN News doing my iconic dance. That's the last thing I just saw on the internet. I don't know nothing about none of that. Okay. So, so speaking of unifying the female rap community. Can I ever expect to see a collab between you and Asian Doll? I don't know. I don't have an issue with Shorty. I so it's possible. Listen, anything is possible. As long as she recognized there's only oh, one vote, queen little trail. bitch. <laughs> Anything is possible. Hitting upside her head is possible, too. <laughs> <laughs> but let me stop. Okay. <laughs> I ain't going to make this interview about her. I don't want to talk about her, no. Tell me this. Anything is when possible. Were... I'm not a tool with her. My talent speaking for me, like, you know? 
She ain't she ain't too with a ghost at this point. Y'all hear that? DC four out that. on all platforms. The single is giving dropping any moment now too. And I'm starting to it's my ten year anniversary. I'm doing some for the rest of the year. Yeah, that's where I want to go. Tell, 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 tell everybody watching this, what you working on, what can we expect, what's next? Um, Singles about to drop. DC4 Deluxe might be on the way. Another, another EP or album as well. I have big features. I don't have to say any names, but I have a single. It's giving. Bitch, I'm back in ASL dropping as well. Uh, and Queen Sosa. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Katie Got B A N D Z, Snapchat, Katie Got Benz 22. And you could also follow the Ain't No Stopping Instagram and Twitter and YouTube as well. Katie, it's been my pleasure, girl. Thank um, you. I'm honored. You got to do my dance God. with me before we go. <laughs> Let's do it. What? I don't usually get on camera, but I might have to do this. You got to This is an iconic moment. Come on now. <laughs> 10 years from now, after 10 years, think about it. Nah, They're going to have me in the Wax Museum, and I'm going to be on the Walk of Fame watch when I tell you. See, Doing my dance. Talk. I love that talk. I love that talk. When, when they have you on the Walk of Fame, I'm going to come out there. Yeah, you better. Take a picture next to the star on Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah, young OG, you hear me? <laughs> no, nah, 100% a young OG. Katie, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Um, you know, I know you've been through a lot, but it's always such a beautiful thing to see people who rise above all of the adversities and conflict that they go through. So I, I I know the best is is yet to come for you, and I and I'm rooting for you, girl. Appreciate you. I'm honored to be here. Make sure y'all download and stream everything. DC four put her in the dirt. Is giving on the way. Go vote, little bitches. <laughs> Will do. Peace. See you later, girl. Peace. Peace.